Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, we speak with legendary U.S. recording artist Lori Anderson about her collaboration with former Guantanamo detainee Mohammed al Gharani. In their collaboration, an art production at the Armory in New York this fall, they raised questions of identity, presence, and habeas corpus. A very special interview with Lori Anderson and Mohammed al Gharani's own testimony coming next. Ever since her hit recording, Oh Superman, in 1981, multimedia artist Laurie Anderson has been raising questions about technology, humanity, justice, and truth. In her latest exhibition at the Park Avenue Armory in New York, she teamed up with Mohammed al Gharani, one of the youngest people ever to be held at the Guantanamo Bay prison. I couldn't be happier to have Laurie Anderson here with me today. Can you set the scene for us a little bit? Describe what we're going to be seeing, what we're looking at? You're going to um, walk into a kind of star field. And uh, in the middle of that field will be um, my collaborator, Mohammed Al Gharani, and uh, projected live onto a, a, a three dimensional screen, let's say, a kind of statue. Uh, which will be uh, just two feet short of the Lincoln Memorial. So it's big. Now it's kind of big partly because we were going to have it 1.6 to have a, a sort of human scale slightly, but they sent a whole lot of extra material. So we, <laughs> so we said, well, let's just try it bigger. And it's, so it's, it's a very beautiful scale now. So tell us about Mohammed Al Gharani, your collaborator. He's, he is, uh, Mohammed is the, the youngest, well, although we have to say officially one of the youngest, and I've, I've had to learn a lot of legal terms in working with this project, um, was one of the youngest detainees at Guantanamo. He was born in Saudi and a uh, Chadian citizen, and he wanted to go to cons computer school, so his uncle had one in Pakistan, and he went off when he was 14. He's in Pakistan studying computers and he was in a mosque one evening and um, there was a raid and he was captured by the Northern Alliance and taken to Bagram, then eventually sold to the Americans. One of the reasons um, was at that point we, the Americans, were looking particularly for Saudis. So um, he was uh, taken and flown to Guantanamo uh, not told where he was for, for six months. He didn't know where he was, and um, it was uh, he was um, eventually released when he was 21. Uh, there were, like most of the people in Guantanamo, there were no charges ever filed, so no possibility of, of ever being having your charges dismissed. I met Mohammed through reprieve. And Reprieve is a group in, uh, they're an international group, but they're based in London. I was looking for a collaborator to do this project. And Kat Craig um, said, I think I might have somebody who could work with you. And uh, so after a series of long uh, conversations, uh, she said, you can uh, uh, have you meet Mohammed Al Gharani and talk on the phone and see what you what you think of each other? Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Gharani. I'm really happy to be here with you people. I know I was like, uh, you know, it was if it's personally to be more than, you know, this one. But you know, as you know, I cannot come there. So I'm happy to 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 talk to you people from here. And I know it seems like, I mean, too big in, in the picture, but I hope I won't scare all of you. So I want to uh, start with... Uh, really there isn't a wall that keeps your collaborator, Mohammed Al Gharani, out of the U.S. He was never charged with anything, as you said. He was released. Why can't he be here right now? Why do you have to telepresence him in? Um, all uh, Guantanamo former detainees are barred from coming to the United States. It's just one of the rules, one of the laws. Um, but first of all, the the legal language in this is um, barred, banned. So there are a couple other words. Um, 
uh, involved in it, but uh, just to give you an idea of, of the kinds of, of language, and I, I mean, I, my work is words and stories and how they're told. So this is, for me, so fascinating because we're looking at how the government told his story versus his own story versus a bigger story of, of uh, borders. So, uh, and, and within the, the language of the way the government tells the story, first of all, the, the first thing they did in order to do, to do what they wanted to do was to declare the Guantanamo detainees non-persons. Nobody actually gave them the right to actually say, I'll call you a non-person. I mean, not really sure how they got that right, but they are non-persons. Um, also one of the directives at the time of uh, uh, when Guantanamo was founding was defined basically, it was called a quote unquote legal outer space. So that's what Guantanamo became. It was a non-place, uh, in terms, a place where, where our, our laws don't apply, none of them. So we could do what we wanted. There were also things like um, questions of, oh, that I would ask about were doctors present at uh, when Mohammed was being tortured. Okay, that question can only be answered by, there were uh, uh, behavioral science uh, consultancy teams involved in the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And did people commit suicide at Guantanamo Bay? People were committing suicide until suddenly, wow, the suicide rates dropped. However, suicide was it, uh, simultaneously redefined as um, uh, uh, let's see, it was called a manipulative, self-injurious behavior. You know, there were lots of people who died of manipulative, self-injurious behavior, but no suicides, bingo. So language is, is, um, uh, is operating in a very, very heavy way. Also, what we're doing now, having a conversation, is what I did with Mohammed a lot. When you read the transcripts of interrogations at Guantanamo Bay, there are these uh, kind of cryptic things, uh, no sound from detainee. Now, you don't know whether he's being electroshocked at that point or not. So those blank <laughs> moments are, are undefined. Why is this combination of pornography and violence happening in, uh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? What right do we have to do this? This is so insane. And so the, that kind of imagery stays with you. So this is about, this is about uh, 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 of course, a, a person who was um, imprisoned and tortured. And, uh, and, but the emphasis is, is more on um, how that story gets told and how his story gets told and, and how they, they match. And the and, details are disturbing, yeah. whether they're gory or not. Yeah. Talking about language, can you share with us what he told you about how he learned to speak English? Mohammed learned English in prison, and the first two words he used, uh, learned were the F word and the N word. He was like, what's the F word, what's the N word? Because people called him that. He decided to learn three words a day, and he got a piece of soap, and he wrote the words uh, on the floor. And then he would erase them when the guard guards was coming, he would, would hide the soap, which he also wasn't supposed to have, and to be doing this with, underneath the door when, during the day. So there's a little, little place that he could stick the soap to hide it. Um, so uh, he was also helped by a number of people there, and uh, primarily Shakir Emir, who is a British resident, and probably came on the same plane uh, that Mohammed did. Uh, to Guantanamo. So they were kind of uh, 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 brothers from the beginning. Yeah, no, Shakir Amir is a really great man, and I named my, my boy after him. And I met him in a jail, and he's a really great man, and he's a very strong brother. And from the day one, he told us to, to stay and unite and stick together. We can face all the troubles coming to us. You know, yeah, Shakir is a great man. Because from the, uh, the beginning weeks, because, you know, when they opened the jail in 2002, 
February. So I think we went in the same airplane to Guantanamo because after we arrived, I met him there. So Shakir, he is very strong guy. From the day one, you know, when we arrived there, no talking, no even, you can't stand up, you can't even pray. They give you water only for drinking. You can't even do the ablution for prayer. So Shakir, from the day one, he told us, we have to stand up. We have to resist. We have to fight. So even they go and beat him up, take him to Seg Black. They bring him back. He's, he's still Shakir. They couldn't change him. And he always tell him, brothers, What was his motivation in participating with you in all this? I asked Mohammed what he, why he wanted to do this, and he said, I wanted to do this to help my brothers in Guantanamo. I said, Mohammed, I, I don't know that this exhibition is going to help your brothers in Guantanamo. I really don't. Secretly, of course, I, I hope it does. You know, it's an art project, but like a lot of other things, uh, it's heavily involved in, in a lot of um, issues of what is suffering, what is justice, what is language, what's a story, whose story are you gonna believe, who's in, who's in charge. Now, also, the American guards are heavily indoctrinated, didn't, you know, and also they joined up, they didn't necessarily join to be jailers, so they're getting a kind of like weird deal anyway. They have to spend three days at ground zero, heavy, heavy, um, propaganda kind of stuff, information, let's say. They're encouraged to be very brutal. Now, that doesn't go down with everyone. There were a number of guards who, at great expense to themselves, were kind to the detainees. American guys who just went, uh, you know, I'm not into this thing. And, um, and they, uh, they suffered by, by showing their, their uh, interest and um, in, in the detainees and the little bits of ways that they were able to help them, but they did that. So uh, Mohammed is, is very, very grateful for that, uh, for the guys who made that effort. God don't have problem with, with Shakir, but the big dogs, you know, the big people, they hate him because they don't want somebody telling them what to do. For example, if God come and hit me, or some of the guards, they, they throw, Urinate on you while you're sleeping and laugh, ha, 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 what you can do, you inside the, the jail. So sh when we complain, they will tell us, they will ask us, which guard? How we know? Because all of them, they black in their name. Because, you know, maybe if we know their names, you know, the way they think. So we don't know their names. Shakir said, give it to them numbers, like we have numbers. So we know if I tell you the number, you don't tell me, you don't know which one. So he, he was like, he, he's a hero. Because, you know, from that day one, he understand that we have to be one. Then they, they want to divide us. They brought, they said, you are level one. So you have blanket, water bottle, uh, you know, extra stuff. You are level two. They divide us for level one, two, three, four. Level four, you don't have anything. Shakir said, everybody level one, everybody level four. We are all same. Then they try to put Saudi in one block, Yemeni in one block, Afghanis in one block. If the problem happened with Saudi, they will tell, if these people also want to be with them, they will say, this is Saudis, what's your problem? Shakir said, that's how they divide us outside. So he's a great man. So he said, no, if problem happened over there, we all stick together. So it, it didn't work. So every time they try to separ separate us, Shakir come in with the idea. No, no, let's do this. Let's do this. For past, I think, six years, 
the separate chakra from the brothers. They to put them alone. And there has been some good news since your show has been, and since word of your show has been out. I don't know if it's related, but. Oh, well, so, yeah, in, uh, in September, I think 25th, September 25th, uh, there was an announcement that Shakur Emir uh, would be um, released within 30 days. We'll see what, uh, if he's out. I mean, we've heard this before, but hopefully this will, this will now be the case, which will really be fantastic. We'll drop it down to 114, I guess, who are still there. Uh, none of the, uh, well, a few of them have charged, been charged, but almost all of them have not. We're running out of time, but I want you to touch on a couple of other things. One, you end up going to the West African country where Mohammed al Garani is. You talk with him, as you've said. You also visit with him to the port, uh, to one of the main ports for the slave trade. Can you talk about that, why you went and what you observed there? Here's the same route from Africa through the Gold Coast to the Caribbean that is 600 years old. 60 million slaves have passed through that, and it's still going on. I visited some of the slavery, you know, coast or, you know, the one, the prison they used for slavery. It's a similar, my, my story, because, you know, the way the shackles, the way they shackle them, the way they take them, you know, they never come and ask, you know, Africans to come and help us build America. They just take them. And the same thing, they just take us, you know, without any question, without telling us where we're going. So they just kidnap them and take them. Same thing, they just kidnap us and take us. It's the same way they did the slavery. It's the same, the, 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 the Caribbean, you know. They take the Africans to the Caribbean Ocean. The same thing took us to the, the same place. And, you know, and uh, the same, the, you know, you had no choice. Everything you do, what they tell you to do. You know, they won't ask you, can you do this? No, they tell you, do this. So, it's, you know, it's kind of a similar story. So you're standing there in one of those holding cells mm -hmm. with Mohammed. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Well, he asked the, our guide so many questions. How tight were the shackles? Were their arms up or were they down? Were they able to lie down ever? No, the answer is no. They were packed in like this. Um, what were the shackles made of? Now, here's a guy who, who walked for, with shackles for almost eight years. So he couldn't really walk. I mean, he's, um, he's much better now, but he's, his back is, is gone. His head was broken. His teeth are all smashed up still. And uh, this physicality of confrontation is something that I wanted to represent in this show and and so that he would be there live looking and he has a camera so that he can see people in the armory. You've worked with technology in your work for years in lots of different ways and I hear in this story there's so many questions it raises but one of them is about technology and what is it doing to our humanity? Is it escape? Is it imprisonment? <laughs> I, I, I'm struck by the fact that the Brutality, so much of what we've seen and heard about in Guantanamo was pretty basic, not involving much technology. Uh, and through this technological me means, you've managed to bring him to us and, and us to him. I'm also reminded that we're using drones to sort of telepresence US empire all over the world. You've thought about this. Where do you come out on, on, on your thoughts about technology and our humanity as we go forward? What's in our future, do you think? I think we, we blame technology for a lot of things. It's just plastic. You know, I, I don't think it makes us meaner or nicer or more creative or anything. I mean, you can make a very dangerous work with a pencil, you know, and you can be really mean with just your fist. Uh, you can also be, you can also just hit that button and go, I'm sitting here in Florida or Utah and boom, I'm just, you know, remotely and very cold heartedly blowing up a family in their station wagon in Pakistan. Um, so one of the things I've become obsessed with is, is wishing that Susan Sontag was around to write something, not just about the suffering of this, but about cameras and, uh, and weapons. 
So uh, shooting and capturing and what happens when you put a lens on a drone so that a weapon be can become a camera that goes whack. What happens when you equip policemen with body cameras? What happens when uh, witnesses have cameras and are able to say, no, that's actually not what happened, officer. It's, this happened right here, officer. The questions include questions of what is justice, what is truth, what is identity. Have you come to answers on any of these? No, you know, that's the great thing about this project is I've tried so hard in this work to make it opinion free. I don't think it says like, you know, um, I don't think it has adjectives like wrongly accused. I don't think, it just, I think I'm, I think I pretty much stayed within the legal limits of being extremely cool. What is habeas corpus? What was the ruling? What did the redacted text say? What did Muhammad's text say? It's full of questions. It's completely open to, uh, to come into and people can, uh, look at the stories. It's all about, you know, reading them for yourself. But you did ask Muhammad what would be justice for him. What did he say? Yes. And he said an apology. That's not going to happen. You know, I don't. Or wouldn't it be great if it did? Why should I say that's not going to happen? What if Obama in his last moment said, you know, we made some mistakes. We rounded up a bunch of people. We kept them. We tortured them. We never charged them. Habeas corpus was thrown out the window. I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry we did that. That's, that's it, you know? That would, that would go a very long way. And that's just looking at facts. We'll link to all the materials Lori just mentioned from Reprieve and the Center for Constitutional Rights at our website. Lori Anderson, thank you so much. It's been fun. Muhammad El Garani was one of the youngest detainees ever held at Guantanamo Bay. At the age of 14, he was abducted, imprisoned, and subjected to torture, a non-person in America's non-prison camp. Close to eight years later, never having been charged or tried, he was released. But like all men who've been locked up in Guantanamo, Muhammad El Garani is barred forever from entering the USA. This fall, artist and thought provoker Lori Anderson brought him here anyway. And as important as that border crossing was for El Garani, it turned out to be just as important for those of us here. For three days this October, Anderson arranged for El Garani to be beamed in via satellite from West Africa, where he lives now with his wife and two children. He was beamed into the huge former drill hall of New York's Park Avenue Armory, where he sat projected onto an enormous white chair, almost the size of the Lincoln Memorial, a living, talking telepresence. Many people have told my story. Now I have the opportunity to speak for the first time, said El Garani. When he ordered him released, Judge Richard J. Leon described the government's case against El Garani as a mosaic of unfounded allegations, including one that he'd been an Al Qaeda operative in London at 11 years old. Collaborating with Anderson was El Garani's first chance to talk with an American who wasn't his interrogator. He then got a chance to meet scores more as the drill hall filled up with people who stayed, some of them for hours, just sitting and lying on the ground in his company. Every so often, a camera was opened up for El Garani's New York visitors. Shyly, then eagerly, they stepped into the light to communicate with him back in Africa. Because of the long distance and a 40-second delay in transmission, talking was impossible, so lots of people waved or mouthed, I'm sorry. One woman, hand on her chest, lifted up a tear-soaked face. A dreadlocked young man, about Al Garani's age, raised a Black Power salute. Forty seconds is a long time for a peace sign to travel halfway around the world. The woman with the tears in her eyes had walked away by the time Al Garani brought his fingertips together into a heart. Forty seconds is a long time, but it's not as long as 14 years of justice denied. We need to close Guantanamo and bring its victims closer. We all, it turns out, have a lot to say.
This week we talk with anti-racist author Tim Wise. So the stuff that white folks have on their plate is in part being cooked up in the kitchen of white supremacy. And hear from New Orleans public school students who are taking back their schools. Then you cut into the stubbornness of my heart and season it with love, laughter, memories, and heartache. It's all coming up right here. Stay tuned. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Andrew Coburn discusses what's wrong with the way the U.S. fights war. George Bush, let's hear it for George Bush. Um, he was actually quite restrained in his use of deployment of drone assassination because he preferred to capture people and torture them. Later in the program, we look at the story of Fahd Ghazi. Fahd Ghazi was one of the first men to arrive at Guantanamo. He was just a few months past his high school graduation. 